This is lesson number six on our studies of discovering our divine destiny. And we're calling this lesson the perfect mirror. We're speaking about the word of God. Let me use for a text, James, the first chapter, verse 22 through verse 25. James, the apostle pastor of the church of Jerusalem said, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I find that interesting that when we hear but don't do it, we're the one we're deceiving. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that observes his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so he's saying here, the word of God is the perfect mirror for us, the perfect mirror. Uh, I've seen that so many times in life that we listen to the wrong voices. The truth is, everybody's listening to somebody. But many times we listen to the wrong voices. The Word of God is like a mirror, and it, it's the only perfect mirror or the true mirror that perfectly reveals God's will for our lives. And according to this uh, verse of Scripture, it's not enough for us just to read God's Word, but we also must meditate upon it, think about it, and put it into practice within our lives. As we meditate on the Word of God, it reveals to us who God wants us to be, who God created us to be. Now, first of all, let me talk about what I'm going to call crazy mirrors. Crazy mirrors. We've all seen the crazy mirrors. These are those mirrors that distort our images. So, you know, they're either concave, convex, sometimes they're wavy. I can remember taking our grandchildren to the museum and the thing that fascinated my grandson more than anything else was the crazy mirrors because here's a little boy that's standing taller than Poppy, you know, I mean, the crazy mirrors. And if we're not careful, that's what other people's opinions about us become like the crazy mirrors. Oh yes, they see things, and, but they really don't see it clearly, so they give us a distorted viewpoint. And they tell you what you can do, what you can't do. I, I'll give you an example that, that we laugh about in our family now. When I was 16 years old, our school took us on a field trip to a radio station, and I can remember I was fascinated by all of this technology in the, the radio station, and, and I had the courage to speak up and tell the radio announcer that I would like to be on radio someday. And he look, looked at me and he said, son, you don't have the voice for it. Uh, oh, we have laughed about that so many times now because that is one of the great gifts that God has given me is my voice. But uh, son, you don't have the voice for it. He just, oh, uh, that, that was a distorted view from someone that really didn't know me. And that's why we need the word of God desperately in our lives because only the word of God can reveal a true picture of ourselves. It's amazing how that, as the Word of God is being taught, as it's being preached, that God will speak things to one individual and another thing to another individual. He is revealing their true identity from His Word. So don't allow the crazy mirrors to mess up your life. Thinking back of the story of David, da David's family was like this. David's father, for instance, only saw David as his baby boy. He was his shepherd boy. He needed somebody to look after the sheep, so he put little Davy to take care of it. David's brothers, on the other hand, they only saw David as their little brother. They, they did not see him as a man, a man of God, a, a warrior. No, 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 they, just, they, they saw him as the little brother. Even the prophet Samuel was not impressed at first. 
It took the word from God. God speaks to Samuel and he knew it was God. Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. This is the one that I have chosen. So God saw what nobody else saw. God saw a king. And God sees things in you and I that nobody else sees. If we're going to fulfill our destiny, we need for God to reveal that to us. Here is an excellent verse of scripture found in the book of 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. He said, but we all with an unveiled face. Remember the lesson where we have to learn to take off the veil and be totally honest with God? We with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into that same image from glory to another level of glory. That's a beautiful scripture and it shows the way that God works within our lives. See, one of the biggest problems that we have is what's going on between our ears. We think bad thoughts, negative thoughts, junk thoughts, garbage thoughts, all kinds of bad things that we think and then we speak them. We need the Word of God to transform our minds, to renew our minds, so we begin to think like God thinks. And it's only God that can do that within our lives. Here's the second thing I want to discuss. I want to talk about what I'm going to call grave clothes. Grave clothes. See, the, the story of in the book of John, the 11th chapter, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and uh, where Jesus said to him, Lazarus, come forth. And immediately, the man that had been dead for four days just appeared. It doesn't say he walked up the steps. And uh, I, my wife and I have been there to Lazarus' tomb, the one they say where he was buried. It, it goes down into the ground. It is very steep, difficult steps to climb. Uh, he doesn't climb out. Why? Because they have wrapped him hand and foot. They, that's the way that they would bury their dead in Israel. And so they have bound him hand and foot. And Jesus says, come forth. And immediately he is there. He didn't climb out. He just, resurrection power brought him. And he's standing there before Jesus. Yet he is bound hand and foot. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Now, that's the way it is for every one of us when we first come to Christ. And many people never get beyond the grave clothes stage in their spiritual journey. Oh yes, they've experienced resurrection power. Yes, they have been forgiven it, and, and they've seen Jesus, met him personally, face to face. He's called their name. I mean, it's resurrection power, and yet they're still like mummies, bound hand and foot. What do they need? They need someone in their life, someone that loves them enough to tell them the truth. Someone in their life to be like the prophets, family, friends, that's close enough to touch them to start removing the grave clothes that have been wound around them. What a graphic picture of so many people's lives and why they never reach their destiny in God, why they become discouraged in their spiritual journey, and many of them even turn back again because they didn't have anyone that could take the grave clothes off of them. There's a good statement that I came across. It's a philosophical statement, but it is really a true statement. The glory of God is man fully alive. Now that could also be said, the glory of God is woman fully alive. But whoever God has created you to be, in that release, you coming alive. For instance, I am a teacher. That's my DNA. That's who I am in Christ. And it's when, when I begin to teach the word of God, I come alive. I, I'm, I'm a 16-year-old again. Why? Not just because of the anointing, but because I am flowing in my gifts, 
who I am. Man fully alive is the glory of God. Now, for so many people, because they never discover who they really are, what are your gifts? What has God called you to do? And God never called any of us to do nothing. No, he always has purpose for our life, destiny for our lives. And it is only when we begin to fulfill that destiny that we come fully alive. I've had people tell me so many times when they go with me on the international trips and I'm standing before pastors and I'm teaching them and, and I come alive. There is no doubt about it. And they will say, you know, there, there's one Dale Yurton and there's another Dale Yurton. They're, they're right because when I'm in my gifting, in my calling, in the place God has gifted me to be, there's nothing like that. That is the glory of God that we see in the life of an individual. So, in every one of us, we can't change our past, but we can learn from our past. We learn from our past by seeking after God and God revealing things and the prophets that God puts in our life, family and friend, that speak the truth to us. They give us insights and help us to make corrections and do things differently. That's how we change our future. The way we change our future is by making wise decisions today. How do we make wise decisions today? You don't repeat the past mistakes. How do we keep from that? By the prophets, by God's presence in our life. It helps us make wise decisions so we can fulfill our destiny. Let me go back, for instance, in the life of David and talk, talk about his terrible sin again. When David committed adultery and then murder, we would think it would be impossible for David to ever to become a spiritual leader again. But he did. The Bible records it, and I'm going to show it to you in just a few moments here. He repented, and God restored him. And he went on to accomplish his crowning achievement. The, the greatest thing that David ever accomplished with his life was building the temple in Jerusalem. Now, I know we call it Solomon's temple because Solomon's actually the one that put the plan or put the workers on the site that built it, but David is the one that raised the finances to build it. David is the one that had the blueprints to build it. Without David, Solomon will build the wrong temple. And so it was a father-son relationship here that they built a temple that outlasted them 450 years. That is incredible. Incredible that anyone can do anything that's going to last for 450 years, but David and Solomon did it. And this was after his terrible sin, after he had fallen in shame. Now, in, in the book of 1 Kings, the 15th chapter, I need to take time to read some of this to you because you may not be familiar with this story. The kings of Israel were known by those that did what was right in the eyes of God or some of them were known by doing what was evil in the sight of God. In, in David's life, David did what was right in the sight of God. In fact, David became the benchmark. And from that time on, they would say, and he was like his father David that faithfully served God. Or they would say, he was not like David. David became the benchmark for him, uh, for, for the kings of Israel. Let, let, let me show you this. Let's go to the book of uh, 1 Kings, the 15th chapter. And I, I want to read these verses because there's, a lot of truth here. I'll start reading with verse uh, 3. In verse 3, it said, And he walked in all the sins of his father as he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord as the heart of his father David. Do you see that? He's being compared to David and said he didn't do what was right. In verse 4, Nevertheless, for David's sake, 
The Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside, had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all his days except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. In other words, that was the, the, the man, the husband that David had, had killed. Drop on down to verse 11. Verse 11, it said, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David. Now, let's, let's take and digest what he is saying in this. David becomes the benchmark, and everybody compares, is compared to David. He was not like David, or he was like David, or he did what was right in the eyes of God like David did, or he didn't do what was right. David served God with all of his heart. Now, in verse 5, the key word in that verse is the word except, except. In other words, sin was not the determining factor in David's life. Now, I, I, I want to take time to point this out because there are many people that after they become Christians, they don't think they will have a problem with sin. After they have walked with God, they never think they will ever do No, 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 none of us are perfect. And the truth of it is, none of us know what we are capable of doing. There's a dark side to humanity. There's a side of us that we don't want to talk about but I have seen better men than myself that have failed, that have fallen. And I'm a fool to think it can't happen to me. I must keep my guard up. I must continually seek after God or I will end up just like them. This word except, God's not ignoring David's sin, but sin was the exception. It was not the determining factor of his life. And David found grace. And God's grace was sufficient. And it's encouraging to me that, to know that even if we fail, if we will come back to God and repent, even then God can restore us. Now, let me talk about a third area here. The third area, I'm going to call it a godly heritage. A godly heritage. Let's use David's life again. David was king. His son Solomon became king after him. Solomon followed God all those early years of his life, but when he was older, he turned away. His heart was turned away because of all the multitude of women that he had become involved with, and the polygamy destroyed him. Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam, would be David's grandson. Rehoboam failed to follow the Lord his God. And uh, he died. His son, Abijah, Rehoboam's son, Abijah, also failed to follow God. Then in the fourth generation, this is David's great, great grandson. The fourth generation, God raises up another king by the name of Asa. Asa, and I read it to you here. And he said, Asa followed after God like his father would be his great-great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather uh, had followed after God, David. Now, what this is doing, it's showing us the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Why does the Bible say that God blessed Asa? It said, for David's sake. Wow, that is powerful. For David's sake. God did not turn away from Jerusalem, did not turn away from Israel, but he raises up Asa, who is a righteous king. And so it's because of David that God blessed Asa. What a powerful thought. That our lives can not only influence those that live around us, but here's a great, great grandson that David never saw with his natural eye. He never saw any of these boys after Rehoboam. He died before they became, were even born, let alone become king. And yet David's prayers are still working. Four generations later, God is still answering David's prayers. That ought to encourage us that how powerful our relationship with God is. Asa's righteous reign was the result of David's righteous rule. 
And because of the relationship that he had, God raises up Asa four generations later. Now, David in 2 Samuel 7 and 18, David asks this question. He goes actually to the tent where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the Bible said he sat there and he is saying, because the prophet had just come and given him a word from God and told him, you're not the one that is to build the temple. Your son Solomon is going to build the temple. But God is going to continue to give you sons to reign upon the throne of Israel. And there will always be a son of David to be the king. And so David responds by going, and it said he sat before God. Sometimes we just need to humble ourselves and sit and wait. He asked God, who am I, O oh God? That's a good question. Who did you create me to be? Who, what am I supposed to do with my life? I know I'm the king, but is that all there is for my life? And of course it wasn't. He goes on to accomplish the building of Solomon's temple. So let me talk about a fourth area. This fourth area, I'm going to call it a mystery name. A mystery name. Let me give you the scripture I take this from, Revelation 2 and 17. Revelation 2 and 17, Jesus is talking to the church and he says, I will give him a stone and on the stone a new name written. Listen, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now that's a powerful revelation of who are we? Only God really knows, and only God can truly reveal it. I will give him a white stone, and on the stone there will be a new name written, which no one else knows except the one that receives it. In other words, only God can reveal our true self. Let me give you another philosophical statement, but I, I believe this is true. It's not the number of breaths that we take which makes life worth living. Let me repeat that. It's not the number of breaths that we take which makes life worth living. No, you know what it is? It's the things which take our breath away. We've all had those moments. Remember, that's how we define life. We define time by minutes. We define life by moments. I mean, you see something and it, it, it is so great. Your mind cannot even absorb it and you just stand there in, in awe with your mouth open. You don't even know anything to say. So it's not how many years you've lived. I, I think, for instance, of Methuselah. It said he lived longer than anybody else, 969 years. But what did he accomplish? The Bible doesn't record anything that he accomplished other than he had a son who had a son. But it says of Enoch, who only lived 365 years, and by faith he walked with God, and he was not because God took him. Wow, what a statement. What a statement. So it's not how many years. So many people are trying to add years to their life. Why don't you start adding some life to your years? Why don't you start finding why were you born? What was your purpose? What is your name that's written upon the stone that nobody else knows? See, that's what's going to make heaven so wonderful. Heaven is going to be filled with sights and sounds that we can't even describe. Every person that I have personally met that have had what they call a near-death experience where they departed and they said that they went and met with Jesus and every one of them described colors that they can't even imagine here in this life. Sounds and music and flowers and that's why it's going to be heaven. It will take our breath away. It will be wonderful. And when God calls our name, it will be a name that nobody else has ever heard, but it will be our very own. God created us to be that. So man fully alive is God's workmanship. 
I'm not interested in imitating other people. No, I want to fulfill the destiny for which I was created. I want to go back to this scripture from Ephesians 2 and 10 because it is not only a powerful verse of scripture, it so clearly illustrates what God wants to do in our life. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, our lives are not an accident looking for a place to happen. No, God is the one that gave you your life. He created you and gave you unique talents, gifts, and abilities. We are God's workmanship. That, that word, remember, workmanship could be translated, we are God's masterpiece. There's no one else like you. You are completely unique in every way that God has created and designed you. And so if God has created you to be a masterpiece, why do you want to be duplicating a copy of somebody else's life? Don't let anyone or allow the devil to rob you of your destiny. I think of the story of Michelangelo as he said, I saw David in that stone and I started removing everything that was not David. And he created what's called a masterpiece that millions of people still go every year to just look at the masterpiece. That's what God wants to do with your life. You were not created to be a copy. You were created to be a masterpiece. And so allow God to help you fulfill your divine destiny. May God bless you.